FR in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, it's Susan Coffin here for Attitude Magazine's ADHD Expert Series. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's webinar. Um, today's session is sponsored by BREM Preparatory School. It's a fully accredited co-educational boarding school for students with language-based and complex learning disabilities. And for more information about BREM, please log on to their website. It's www.bremhm.org. Um, as parents of children with learning and attention deficits, many of us find our children's behavior frankly mystifying. There's oppositional behavior, what seems to be boredom, um, and much more. What is going on? How should we respond? Um, we're so pleased today to welcome Jerome Schultz, PhD, to discuss how stress impacts learning and behavior in kids with ADHD and LD. Um, Dr. Schultz will help us understand how chronic stress affects the brain, affects our children's behavior, social skills, and much more. He'll also describe some strategies that we can use to help our children reduce stress at home and at school. Uh, Jerome Schultz, PhD, is a clinical neuropsychologist, He's been one for more than 30 years. He's on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School and the chair of the Professional Advisory Board of the Learning Disabilities Association of America. If you don't know LDA, um, I recommend it strongly to you. Dr. Schultz is the author of Nowhere to Hide, Why Kids with ADHD and LD Hate School and What We Can Do About It, a ter terrific book. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Schultz. We're grateful for your presence. My pleasure. Glad to be on uh, with you. Me, great. Thank you. Um, let me just describe briefly how this we uh, webinar works. Um, you are muted, attendees. Thank you for being here. Please post your questions for Dr. Schultz in the box on your screen. After his presentation, he'll respond to as many questions as time permits. If you have problems hearing us, please dial in via your phone line. This is an internet-based webinar. Um, after our session, you'll find a summary of Dr. Schultz's slides as well as the audio of this broadcast on the Attitude website. It's attitudemag.com slash webinars. And within a week or so, we'll have a podcast version available in the iTunes store in the ADHD Experts audio series, along with the archive of many other Attitude ADHD Expert podcasts. So with that introduction, let me turn it over again to Dr. Schultz with our thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks a lot, Susan, uh, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to uh, such a large audience tuning in today. And uh, I... Oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, Stuart, we can hear you now. Is Dr. Schultz back? Okay. <laughs> okay, hang on one second. S Susan? Yes. Uh, Dr. Schultz's computer rebooted. Oh, dear. So, uh, let me let me switch him over to telephone and he can start talking um and then if everybody i think here is is hearing us but if you'll just basically explain to them and i'll basically get him set up okay, okay. hey everyone please hang on for one second it sounds like dr schultz is having computer problems and we will switch him over to a telephone line 
because we're very anxious to hear his, um, what he has to say. Um, I do recommend for those of you who are interested in this topic, his book, which I had the It's uh, very inspirational, a great deal of hope involved in, um, in the techniques that he presents. The name of the book is Nowhere to Hide, Why Kids with ADHD and LD Hate School and What We Can Do About It, Jerome J. Schultz, Ph.D. To those of you who asked whether you need to use the phone instead of the computer, the answer is no. You should be fine. Um, it's Dr. Schultz that we need to get on the phone. So stay tuned. We're working on it. Thank you. So sorry for this delay. Susan? Yes. Uh, Dr. Schultz is Dr. Schultz is dialing back in. Okay. Thank Hello, you. I'm here. Hi, Dr. Schultz. Thanks for dialing back in. <laughs> sure. Talk about uh, stress, eh? <laughs> yes. This carries it to an extreme. Uh, I assume I'm live with about a thousand people right now. That's exactly right. You're live with a thousand and four attendees who are saying oh. good work. Technical one of them said technical difficulties happen to us all. So. All right. Well, let me just keep going. I'll keep rolling here and uh, try to exhibit great and grace under pressure, as they say. <laughs> Thank you. So my apologies to the audience. Thank you for being there. Uh, you should have a, a slide in front of you that uh, says, stress, do you, know, do you know the feeling? And you know that I do, and I assume that you do. And uh, we're going to spend some time talking about uh, why this presentation isn't just about stress in general, but a very specific kind of stress. Let's put that into context first. The next slide you're looking at is one that says good stress with some traffic lights in front of it. Uh, good stress is the kind of stress that really keeps us alive. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't survive as a species. It's the kind of stress that says, well, there's something happening in our environment. Uh, it's a challenge to us, but we know we can do something about it. It's the stress uh, that I call the get ready, get set, go stress, or the bring it on stress. It's, it's, a, it's a good kind of stress because it keeps us alert, it keeps us aware, and as I said, it keeps us alive ultimately. The next slide looks at uh, what most folks refer to as tolerable stress. And this is kind of like the short-term things that happen, negative things that happen in our, in our environment, uh, things that um, put us in a situation of more risk or more danger, uh, but things that we uh, can overcome because we say we can. We, we, have a, we have a good attitude with stress that's uh, toler tolerable stress. So we say things to ourselves. and kids say things to themselves like, I can handle this. This is really not a big deal. It's a big problem, but I know I can control it. The next slide talks about the, the type of stress that I'm most concerned about with kids with ADHD and LD, and that's toxic stress. 
Toxic stress, of course, is the kind of stress that happens to us uh, and that is really damaging to our brain and uh, has a significant negative impact on our performance because it's the kind of stress that we get when we feel like we don't have control over threatening ev events. If you look at the next slide, you see a great Gary Larson cartoon there. The caption is, I asked you a question, buddy. What's the square root of 5,247? I can't read my copy very well here on paper, but you get the impression. Stress personified is that guy standing at the bar uh, with, a, with his hand ready to be put on his pistol. And this poor fellow on the right is just trying to have his sarsaparilla or whatever he's having at the bar. And he really can't get out of the situation. It's that kind of stress that concerns me about kids with ADHD and, and LD. And I use those terms uh, not interchangeably, but I know there's a very strong relationship between attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and learning disabilities. And uh, many kids who have one condition also have the others. So the impact of stress, whether your difficulties or challenges are caused primarily because of attention deficit disorder or primarily because of learning disabilities. The stress is very similar. Let's look at the issue of why there's more stress in kids in general. The next slide identifies several areas that I think explain why kids today are under more stress. And if I really believe that this is a real, a very uh, real phenomenon. I spend two or three days of my week in schools across the country uh, doing consultations, and I'm hearing from teachers, especially teachers of very young kids, that the amount of anxiety and stress that kids are exhibiting uh, is at a level that they haven't seen before, and that really concerns me. For me, it's kind of a canary in the coal mine function because these kids are saying we're creating a world for them that's not protecting them or shielding them from the stress and anxiety. So uh, maybe it's a wake-up call for us to be a little more vigilant about that. Kids live what I think are faster-paced lives. Uh, things move very quickly, especially in an era of technology. Uh, most schools in the country are dealing with increased uh, standards. Uh, High-stakes testing are the, kind of the evil manifestation of that. Um, I, I, there, there are some good things about high-stakes testing. I don't want to be uh, misunderstood there, but I think one of the things that's happening is that as the stakes get higher and the amount of testing increases, we've got a lot more kids who are under pressure, performance uh, pressure that we haven't had in the past. Also, many families live with economic woes and worries, and that adds to a child's stress because uh, most kids can't leave those kinds of worries at home. Every day, kids are bombarded either in the newspaper or electronically by news, national, international news that brings an, uh, an endless onslaught of uh, negative messages, negative images, and, and uh, sad and tragic events to the ears and eyes of little kids who don't have the developmental maturity to handle it. Um, we see kids in a culture today who don't play as much as they used to play. Uh, the, the concept of play dates is living proof of that. You know, we structure everything that kids do. Uh, and play is really important, not only for general development, but for the reduction of stress and, and, uh, real, and for the relaxation and fun that kids need to have. Uh, kids uh, ha are notoriously uh, um, uh, plagued with uh, sleep problems. They don't get enough sleep. Their sleep is interrupted. Their sleep is interrupted by stress or external noises or uh, more and more by electronic media that's kept under their blanket or their pillow or next to their bed that's flashing all night long. I think one of the uh, most important reasons there's more stress in kids is because we don't have and have not implemented what I would consider to be an adequate failure training program for kids. That means that kids experience failure to be sure, uh, but they do it in a high-pressured, high-stakes environment that says failure means you are no good, you are a failure, instead of saying, well, you missed this question or you didn't do this item right, and uh, you know what you have to do about it. So I can talk for days about that, and I don't have days, but I think you, uh, hopefully you can understand what I'm talking about here. Kids are not inoculated to, to failure, and when it happens to them, they don't bend. They tend to be brittle and break, and we see increases in uh, anxiety disorders, and unfortunately, and increases in suicides that I think are a direct consequence to that. 
Next slide says, do your kids uh, know the feeling? I hope that if you're a parent listening in, you talk to your kids about this or you read the signs that they exhibit uh, that suggest that stress is a factor. You can see it on their faces. You can see it in their performance. They may not talk to you about it because they may not even know what it is. Uh, kids need to be educated about stress, what it is, how it affects their brains, and how it affects their performance, and more important, what they can do about it. Let's go to the next slide, which asks, why are kids with ADHD and learning disabilities especially vulnerable to stress? I think the implications are pretty clear there. The next slide uh, discusses the neurobi neurobiological characteristics of ADHD and learning disabilities, which in and of themselves uh, can have a negative impact on learning. When the learning disability is improperly diagnosed or insufficiently diagnosed or ADHD uh, is misdiagnosed or uh, called something else like lazy or, or unmotivated, um, kids with biologically determined neurobiological characteristics uh, have difficulty learning because of these conditions. Of course, when they're in the right kind of schools, the right kind of programs, and have, the, have teachers and parents who understand it, these kids can certainly do well. But by virtue of the condition, there is a rather persistent difficulty uh, in learning, a challenge in learning, and, if, and that can lead to a lot more stress and frustration in the lives of kids. If you look at the, the next slide, you see a picture drawn by a young woman I've renamed Samantha. Uh, you can read in the text, her text, that's on this uh, actually very, ta uh, very talented, she's a very talented artist, and on this rendering, of, which is really a self-portrait, she's talking about uh, her brain on uh, uh, um, on learning disability. She says, it is not that I do not uh, want it or like it, and so forth. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm, it's not on my screen. I only have a small copy in front of me, but I'm going to ask you to, to look at that text. If you can see in her handwriting the evidence of her learning disability. And Samantha was a young woman I met many years ago who, who made this drawing as, on her journey to self-discovery about learning disabilities. The good news is that while well, she was fairly depressed at the time she drew, made the drawing, um, a discussion that ensued as a result of the drawing helped her develop a better understanding of her condition, a better self-concept, uh, and less depression and less stress. I want you to, if you look at the next slide, I invite you to think about a child you worry about. It's, uh, I'm, I'm worried about kids like Samantha and others like her. Uh, because I think there are some things that we can do for kids that can help them um, experience uh, school and learning in a much happier way. Let's look at the next slide. You see two kids coming out of a kindergarten room. One says to the other, if these are the happiest years of our lives, you can imagine what's in store for us. Kids in school often feel trapped and they feel like really there's no way out of it. That's one of the reasons I entitled my book Nowhere to Hide, because these kids really don't have an option. Sometimes if they get caught in a situation where there's an incredible amount of stress, we see them acting in, acting up, acting out, and uh, school goes on for a very long time. So let's look at the next slide and look at the uh, neurobiology of stress. The subtitle says there, it's all in your head, and then at the bottom, you see it says, well, almost. Most of what's related to stress goes on in your brain, but a lot of it goes on in your body as well. If you look at the next slide, you see on the left a picture of the, uh, some, a slide of the normal, a brain tissue of a normal mouse who's been reared in conditions of, of comfort. That is, the mouse was in a cage, he was fed, he was handled, there were low lights, there was music playing. It was a pretty good life for the, mouse, for the mouse until his brain was sacrificed for science so he could give us this slide. But if you look at the slide of this normal neuronal tissue, you see this wonderful, beautiful branching of the neurons uh, in the brain, and that's a healthy brain. If you look on the right-hand side in comparison, you see the slide that was donated, if you will, by a mouse who was under incredibly strong conditions, loud noises, music uh, blaring, uh, never handled, not fed or watered appropriately, and that's the picture of a stressed brain. 
Of course, there are mice brains, but mice are often used in uh, as human representatives when we look at physiological challenging challenges. And this is the consequence of living a life uh, with stress. Stress does a lot of things to our bodies. Uh, among the most significant is that it triggers the production of a hormone which is called cortisol. On the next slide, you look at something which you may know of as the HPA axis or the hypothalamic uh, uh, pituitary adrenal axis. And if you look at the three circles that are on the screen there, you see in the upper left-hand side the hypothalamus. And what this picture represents is that when the brain perceives something in the environment that, that human feels is stressful, the hypothalamus alerts and releases a chemical uh, which is shorthand, the shorthand name for the chemical is CRH. It's really a trigger for a chemical message going to the pituitary gland, which sits just behind our nose. And when that gland is ac activated in a stress situation, it produces a hormone called ACTH, which then goes through our body down to the adrenal cortices. The cort adren adrenal glands are on uh, either side of our body, in the back of our body, on the uh, and their, their uh, main function, or one of their main function, it functions is producing cortisol, which is the hormone that then you can see from those arrows go back, goes back up to these structures in the brain and creates a wonderful kind of balance. Under ideal conditions, we can tolerate stress because these biochemical responses help us uh, develop what's called uh, homeostasis. We get ourselves in a balance that allows us to deal with the dangers in our environment. The next slide shows a detailed cutaway section of the midbrain where we can see uh, the hippocampus, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, all the parts of the brain that are referred to as the primitive parts of the brain, those that develop first in our, in our um, biological uh, development. And then you can see the adrenal gland there at the bottom, and you can see those little dots representing the chemicals moving around in our body in a very um, productive and well-balanced manner. If we go to the next slide, we can see where the problem happens. In, in uh, a situation where the stress is continuous or the stress is very intense, this wonderful, beautiful, adaptive, and protective uh, feedback system breaks down. Uh, this is an oversimplification of the process, of course, but we know when there's too much cortisol or too little cortisol, uh, this is not good for brain f functioning. And the reason that's true is that uh, because under chronic stress, the brain really resets itself and doesn't respond in ways that um, are healthy. If we look at the next slide, we can see that uh, picture of a fellow trying to get on a horse there. Uh, just, uh, it's another wonderful Gary Larson cartoon. He's getting uh, trying to get on the horse, but he's got uh, uh, gross motor coordination problems, and he knocks over the three ponies that are waiting. Who's watching from the window of the Red Dog Saloon? Well, of course, that's the vice principal in charge of discipline and the school bully. It happens over and over and over again in the life of a kid who makes more mistakes than he does, uh, than he has successes. Chronic stress reduces the tolerance for difficulty and frustration. The more of it we have, the worse we become at it. We know that stress has both a physiological, a psychological, and behavioral impact. So it's a really an important factor to understand in school. Let's go to the next slide, uh, which says stress is reduced when kids have learned that ADHD or learning disabilities is not an excuse for poor performance, but a way to explain their challenges. They're like this little boy who says to his teacher, can we hurry up and get to the test? My short-term memory is better than my long-term memory. Uh, I'm sure there are a thousand people chuckling about that uh, cartoon. I'm sorry, I can't hear it, but you understand the point. We create kids. If we, could, my goal is, we create kids who can say things like that. But then, as teachers and other professionals, we really need to listen to them and, and do what they're telling us. Let's go to the next slide, which busts the myth that says if we put kids together with other kids with similar disabilities, uh, that can fix the, the problem. Here's a situation where a young man's going in a siege to the castle, and he's distractible, and he pays attention not to the guys with hot boiling oil up above them, but rather to what's going on in the moat around the castle. And he says, oh, goldfish, everyone, goldfish. Well, 
those other guys aren't going to want to take him on a field trip next time because uh, he causes them some significant consequences. So what's a delightful trait in some kids can be a real liability in a social situation. Speaking of which, let's move to the next slide. Here's a simple field trip to the moon gone awry. You see one boy on the moon with his best friend, and he, in, in his exuberance, raises his hands in joy and smacks his fellow uh, classmate in the, in the helmet, breaking the glass. We've made it, Warren, he says, the moon. And this is uh, like all these cartoons. There's something we can laugh at there, but there's something we can be really sad about, too, when we think about it not being the moon, but recess or playground or a field trip or a birthday party or other places where the kids we care about uh, have difficulties interacting with their peers. Poorly chosen after school activities can actually make stress worse. So it's important to either make sure kids are really well prepared for the environment we're putting them into, or we try to create an environment where they're less likely to bump into these relative weaknesses in their profile. If you look at the next slide, you see what this is like in the animal world. Here are two hyenas. One talks to the other and says, you mean all this time you've been laughing at me, not with me? Uh, we see this happen all the time with kids who have difficulty with what we call reading the room, kids who have difficulty perceiving what's going on between or among their classmates, kids who have difficulty uh, interpreting a joke, making sense of it, and getting into all kinds of socially embarrassing situations as a result of it. All those kind of situations increase the stress that these kids are under. In the next slide, I say it's hard to find what I've come to call an oasis of uh, tranquility. And that just really means for me a moment of peace in a, in a very, very uh, busy life that we have uh, with kids. You know, I may, I'm realizing as I look at the slide progression, I may have confused things because I think I turned those around. So I'm going to try to get us back on track. I hope you've been able to follow along despite the fact that I flipped over the wrong page, I think. But right now, I'm going to see if we can coordinate, coordinate what I'm looking at with what you are looking at. And that should be a slide of the human brain. I will backtrack a little bit and look at um, the neurobiology. You, see a, you should see a slide of a side view of the human brain with the cortex, the gray matter on top. And then in the front, there's a lot of language on this slide. But what I want you to pay attention to here, if you remember earlier, I talked about the midbrain or the primitive section of the brain becoming activated in stress. And in the center here, you see this small uh, circle in the center which says fight or flight. When we're in a stress situation, that's the area of the brain that activates to keep us healthy, to keep us safe. The interesting and important thing in terms of this discussion is that when that area activates, the frontal lobe, or on the left-hand side, the prefrontal cortex actually uh, goes to sleep. It settles down. It, goes, it takes a back seat to the survival part of our brain. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Your kid is sitting in a classroom trying to do work that he or she believes is too difficult or too challenging for him or her. Uh, that's a fear situation, a fearful situation, in which the child is really trying to do what's quite normal, and that is to protect himself against the, the thing that's causing him to worry that he might not look successful or be successful. It's a time when he really needs to have his executive functioning abilities really firmly in place. But under stress, the executive functions, which are primarily housed in that prefrontal cor cortex, take a back seat. So this is a child who, at the time he needs it most, the parts of his brain that are most responsible for success are not activated. So you can understand the implications here in one slide of the impact of stress on higher level cognitive functioning. Many people talk about uh, a, uh, an executive function deficit. And as you see, it's not really a deficit as much as it is a reaction to uh, a stressful situation that decreases the likelihood that the executive functions will work well or work at all. So you can understand how we can't specifically train executive functions to work better if, in fact, it's stress that causes the problem. If we look at the next slide, 
we see that kids with learning disabilities and ADHD often find themselves at this intersection where we as caring adults are saying to kids, I'm sure you can do this. I really believe in you. And that's not a bad thing to say. But if the child conversely is saying, uh, I know I can't do this, and saying things like, I feel stupid, I feel dumb, I can't do this, they're actually in a double, a, a double bind here because not only are they feeling incompetent, but they're feeling incompetent in front of someone who believes in them, who loves them, who says, I think you can do this. Think about what that situation would be like for you if, if you can't swim, for example, and you don't, you, you're afraid of water, but somebody you really care about says to you, hey, I believe that it's okay for you to jump in the deep end of this pool where the water's going to quickly go over your head and probably cause you to drown. You're not going to be thinking about the task of jumping into the pool. You're going to be trying to figure out where the nearest exit sign is. The next slide is the beginning of four slides that show the, con the, the consequence of this. And it's, I've, co I've called this in my book the need to save FACE. And that's not a misspelling there, because the acronym FACE stands for fear, avoidance, um, stress, uh, and escape. In the slide that you're looking at now that says fear, that means that there's something that happened in the environment that makes us worried that we're not going to be successful. We've got a math worksheet filled with problems. We have a reading page filled with difficult words. Whatever the situation, we might have been asked to speak publicly. On the next slide, you see how fear leads to the avoidance that is our natural reaction to being in a stressful situation. We really want to get, it, get the heck out of there. It's hard for us to engage with something that we believe in our minds is too difficult for us. And I'll stop for a moment here and say it doesn't matter if we as the adults believe a child can do it. It doesn't even matter if the child has done something like this before. Because here, perception rules, perception reigns. If a child doesn't believe she can do something, that fear cycle goes into effect instantaneously. The prefrontal cortex is shutting down. The blood is going to the feet because we want to get out of the situation, and we're getting ready to run. So trying to learn under that situation is just uh, a real incompatible situation. The next slide shows how fear giving rise to avoidance creates that stress response. And then we look at the next slide, the fourth in this series, and we see how fear leads to avoidance, leads to stress. And what do we do as a result of that? We really try to get out of there. So some kids try to escape these stressful situations by acting up or acting out or calling attention to themselves for things that are not related to the learning task. Some kids react to the stress by acting in, putting their heads down, becoming what I would call uh, aggressively passive, kids who look unmotivated, kids who look like they're uh, sleeping. Uh, we see kids also who might get up and roam, roam around the school or try to run out the side of the school, or kids who go to the nurse's room very often, because not because they're sick, but because they're trying to avoid a situation that they consider to be toxic. Let's go to the next slide, uh, which says uh, that kids under stress react with academic fight or flight. Most of us are familiar with the fight or flight response. But here, this means to me that the students with ADHD, when they're confronted with the unabated stress created by exposure to tasks that are in reality or in their perception too difficult for them, that is threatening to them, they exhibit the protective behavior any organism does under stress. Next slide. They resist or they avoid. They challenge or they argue. Here we see kids who might be oppositional, might exhibit what some people even call oppositional defiant disorder. I think that's a real misnomer in many cases. Next slide. When teachers and specialists see kids with learning challenges pulling away from the task, getting silly, making jokes, tearing a paper up, saying this really this is stupid, why am I doing this? They may misread these behaviors as oppositional or inattentive or unmotivated or lazy. Think about the numbers of kids who are given the diagnosis of ADHD because they look like they're inattentive. These kids, some of these kids might in fact just be avoiding the looking like they're inattentive because they're avoiding the task because they don't think they can be successful. I think some of these behaviors are the predictable reaction to stress. Let's look at the next slide that says, this is not all gloom and doom, folks. There is room for hope and reason to be hopeful. 
when, when stress is effectively managed in kids with ADHD and learning disabilities, things can get better. better. I spent some time in my uh, book talking about uh, and creating a model which I called the de-stressed model, the de-stress model. And in the next uh, slide, you, see, you might see a picture of the cover of uh, my book. I hope that you get the chance to take a, a look at it because the de-stress model is as clearly explained there. We don't have time to go over the model in this presentation. We might do that in a later presentation. You can also find it by going to my website. There's some articles there that have the de-stress model embedded in, um, in another article. If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll come to a close here so we have some time for questions. I just want to, there's a slide there, another wonderful Gary Larson cartoon that says, uh, a final caution, I say, if you advocate for change in a child's classroom or program in order, in an attempt to deal with reducing stress, just try not to make things worse. You take a moment to look at that delightful cartoon that really sends the message that there's always an opposite and equal reaction to anything we do. So let's just be thoughtful about it. At this point, we're going to move to the last slide, which has some contact information for me. I encourage you to uh, follow me on Twitter, take a look at my blog on the Huffington Post. Uh, if you get the chance, take a look at my book. And also, there's a, a series of videos that I've done for a wonderful site called kidsinthehouse.com. Uh, and I hope that you have a chance to continue uh, learning from me and with me and sharing your information with me through those, uh, uh, those uh, resources there. I'm going to stop talking and let somebody on your end take over and field some questions, and let's see if we can keep technology working. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dr. Schultz. Um, someone's posted that every teacher and school administrator should be required to listen to this webinar, to what you just said. So, I love uh, you all. <laughs> <laughs> your points were extremely clear, and I think, I do believe that the way you are describing behavior is game-changing in terms of when you think about what it really means and how it explains so much of the behavior that we hear about so often at Attitude. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, relationships with the school. There are a number of posts, I won't um, read any one of them, but they are, there are a number of people who say that while they see clear signs of stress in their children, um, their teacher or the classroom doesn't seem to understand that that's the situation. Um, what's the best way for a parent to communicate with the school about these topics? Well, it's, a, it's an excellent and really important question because I think this stress piece is really the missing part of the puzzle and it explains a lot of the behaviors we see in kids and teachers are fortunately becoming more and more sensitive about the impact of stress in the lives of their kids. Unfortunately, I say because most of them are feeling more stress than they've ever had in their jobs before so they're, they're tuned into this topic. I think it's important for a parent to find out what the culture of the school uh, uh, says about stress. Does it recognize it in its comments to parents? Does it recognize it in the comments that teachers meet, make to kids in the classroom? If there's no mention of it, if there's no conscious effort to make stress a public issue in school, to make kids understand that everybody feels stress at one time or another, if they're just ignoring it altogether and the pressure keeps continuing, then there's a change that has to be made at the, higher, at the, at the highest levels. And parents and parent-teacher organizations and, and even teacher uh, organizations can be helpful in that regard. Because the schools aren't addressing it, there's something really seriously missing from their their curriculum. Um, I think if kids are feeling stressed and they're able to articulate it and they understand it, one of the most powerful things that can be done is that if a child can write a letter or even make a, a recording of or draw a picture of what it feels like to be under stress and share that with his or her teacher and let them know that you know to, if they understand their brains well enough, they'll be able to say, you know, teacher, when I'm under stress, I'm not working at my peak efficiency. And when I, when I can relax in school and when I can feel competent in school, I can be the kind of student you really want me to be. There's nothing more powerful than an articulate student talking to a teacher who is an empathic person. It's a great formula. It doesn't take any time or money to do this, but it takes a lot of courage. So let me stop with that idea. On Huffington Post just today, there was a series of pictures that were made by kids that show what stress looks like. It's worth taking a look at. Wow. Um, sounds very powerful. 
To your point about um, helping kids articulate what it feels like, I mentioned to you, this to you before we started the webinar. A, a number of people have a hard time talking with their kids about learning and attentional um, disabilities. They're afraid of labeling them. They're not sure how to convey it. What's your suggestion for parents on how to, how to get children on board with coping with their own attentional and learning um, issues? Yeah. Now, there are a lot of people who don't like to use the word disabilities with kids and don't like to talk about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder with kids. Uh, the fact is that we have conditions that are recognized by, um, by modern medicine and science, and there are organi many organizations that support kids with these diagnostic uh, labels or titles. So I think it's part of the world we live in. I understand wanting to be euphemistic about that, but when kids don't understand their learning disability or their ADHD, they, they are very quick to call it something else, which is a lot worse than those disability labels. They call it stupid. They call it retarded. They, you hear it, I hear it every day in schools from kids who are not either miseducated, they're miseducated or undereducated about their own condition. I think it's really important for parents to speak on a developmentally appropriate level with their kids about the fact that their brains are in fact different from the brains of other kids. And that's a difference that doesn't mean that their brains are worse than or not as good as or deficient in any way, but they process information in a different way. And that's an important thing to honor and respect because it's a reality. If we say, oh, you just need to try harder, which a lot of people say, uh, that's going to put these kids in a bind. They do have to try harder, but they also so has to have to try smarter and they have to learn how to work around these problems. Just the same as if somebody were um, had a broken leg or were, were uh, missing a finger and needed to write in a different kind of way. These are human differences which make, uh, which increase the amount of challenges that kids have and they need to understand it. I also think kids need to have a much better understanding of what happens in their brains and their bodies under stress. We say to kids often, you need to relax. If you just settle down, things will be better. A lot of kids have no idea what that means to relax, to settle down, because they live in such a state of hyper excitation. Um, in a fast-paced world. I think we really need to spend time finding those oases of tranquility to let kids just sit for 30 seconds without moving or listen to quiet, peaceful music. So when we say to them, you need to settle down, they have some idea physiologically what that means. I'd love to see a seventh grade class or a sixth grade class do a science lesson on the impact of stress on cortisol production. It's really easy to measure cortisol in the human body. All you have to do is take a hot and swab and get a swab of saliva and send it out for a test. I think there's a new app that's available that lets you get an instantaneous reading on, uh, on uh, cortisol levels in saliva. It would be great to have a project where a science teacher would collaborate with the school nurse and then talk to kids about how to reduce their stress level in school by competence, by confidence, by practice, and then remeasure their cortisol levels when they were working at peak efficiency. That would be the greatest research I can imagine, actually. That would, that would be amazing, yep. Um, see here. In general, people would love it if you could spend a little time on the de-stress model. I mean, I know it was at the end and you had to fly through it, but are there some highlights there that um, you would point to people in terms of how to help their children cope with stress? Yeah, uh, I think it's, I came up with the model because I wanted to have something that was easy to remember and that, that would give me and other people the opportunity to think about certain things when we're talking about uh, putting kids in a better situation. The, the first, the D in the de-stress model uh, is an important place to begin, and that's really defining the problem. If, if you have a child who has a learning disability or has ADHD and people are still debating about whether that's a valid diagnosis or a valid uh, descriptor of the, of the condition, uh, then we have what I too often see as um, a situation of what I call dueling 
diagnosticians where people are sitting across the table, schools and professionals are disagreeing about the presence of the condition. Until we define the condition as adults and make sure that we have at least uh, an agreement to move ahead based on the definition of the problem, what we do after that will be fraught with confusion and uh, sometimes contention. There will be arguments and debates. So if parents have the opportunity to get the professionals who made the diagnosis together with teachers or vice versa so that people can come to, a, to some kind of common agreement about what's going on, uh, that's a better place to start. It's a better place to start the journey. The E in the de-stress model is to educate, and that means once we adults get it, we have to teach kids about their own conditions, about their learning disabilities or ADHD, and how it might get in the way of their success, how it might also be an asset to them. Um, Having learning disability and having attention deficit hyperactive disorder, uh, hyperactivity disorder are not necessarily liabilities, but they can be liabilities. They can also be assets because they give kids the opportunity to look at the world in unique and very uh, wonderful ways. The S in the model has to do with speculate. I use the word speculate there. That means look at look ahead with a child to identify what I've come to call helpers and hurdles. What are the things that are going to help you, despite the fact that you might have this condition? What's going to help you jump over this hurdle and, and be successful? And conversely, what are the kinds of things that are going to get in the way of your success? Do you need my help with it as an adult? And what are you going to do it by yourself? I'm, sh I'm shortening this a, a, a bit, but I think you get the essence. The T in the model has to do with teaching kids the strategies they need to be successful, uh, teaching them, above all, how to do an honest self-appraisal. A lot of kids overvalue their work or devalue their work in a way that I think is unhealthy and doesn't move them forward. The R in the distress model has to do with reducing the threat. If one paper filled with 30 problems causes stress in a kid, take one problem at a time. If one classroom filled with kids causes stress for a child, then make small groups available for that child. So the idea is taking the things in the environment that you can be manipulated to reduce the threat that the child feels. Three more letters to go. One is exercise. We can't forget about that. If every kid in America exercised in school more regularly, stress would go down and performance would increase. It's that simple. We have to to think about their nut proper nutrition, proper hydration. If you haven't read it, read a book by uh, 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 John Ratey, R-A-T-E-Y, called Spark, about exercise. The next letter is S. That's for success. That means that once we do all these things, success starts to replace failure. As I said earlier, a lot of these kids have had little opportunity to know the joy of success because they've been so busy either having failures or trying to avoid them that they can have fun and experience success. And the last S in the model is to strategize. That is, knowing what you've learned through this process and all about yourself, look ahead and see what the biggest challenge is going to be now, whether it's the transition from elementary school to middle school or high school to college or college to work life and so forth. But think about what you, you've learned and don't let, every, don't, let, don't let these changes catch you by surprise, but move ahead strategically based on your knowledge, based on your sense of confidence, based on your competence and, and the reduction in stress that you've had in those situations because of that. So I think that's the fastest I've ever talked about the de-stress model. <laughs> There's a huge amount there. Hey, everybody, read the book. The book is great. <laughs> Again, nowhere to hide, it's called. Um, Dr. Schultz, questions about um, kids who just really are resistant to, to help. There's I'll read just one, um, one comment. My daughter, 16, is failing in her classes but insists over and over again that she'll handle it herself. The stress is making her sick, migraine, stomach pain, but she won't open the door even a crack to outside help, whether it's her father, me, therapist, teachers. Um, another similar question, you know, um, very resistant to any help. So it seems that I'm assuming that that's another example of, of a stress, of a flight or <laughs> flight effect, but what, what's, your, what's your feeling on that resistance? I, I think you have to put that parents cope? What's, what's the last thing you said? And how should parents cope with that, or teachers for that matter? I think you should put the stress question on the agenda. It has to be considered a possibility. Think about a child who won't ask for help because as soon as she gets it, it's going to be from somebody she admires or respects or loves. 
and they're going to find out how stupid she is. So if okay. that's what her, where her mindset is about this, that's going to be a problem. In order for kids to feel less stress about things that are really difficult, they need to feel competent and confident. So if they're behind the eight ball all the time, if the pressures of school, uh, the standardized testing movement, uh, the high expectations, uh, put these kids under too much stress, they're going to continue to re retreat. Remember, remember, too, if they master what they're doing at that time, what's the next thing that we're going to do? We're going to give them more to do. So they're really behind the eight ball on this. I think we have to consider the fact that um, the phrase that I've started to use more recently is that excellence has become the new average. Think about so, that for a minute. Excellence has become the new average. We expect every kid in school to do everything really, really well. And that's just a setup for stress and frustration. It's a setup for depression. It's a setup for suicide. Uh, the kids ought to be able to understand that, there are, that we come equipped to exhibit a range of human behaviors. And if excellence is the only thing we can be, we're not going to be very, we're not going to do that very often. There are few people in the world who can be excellent at everything, but there are far and few between. When kids feel like they've got to be the best at everything and be in honors classes or they're a failure or take a curriculum that's loaded with coursework so they can get into the best college, these kids are really going to implode. And that, that frightens me a lot. So I think the idea about a child who doesn't ask for help, won't accept help, I think it's important to understand what it is that she's doing and is she being efficient. If she says, I can handle this myself, give her a little bit of time to do that. And then say, I'm going to give you a month, a week, uh, two weeks, a semester, whatever it might be. And at the end of that time, you say, you know what, honey? I, I really thought you could, you thought you could, but it's just not working. And, and what's, what, I, what I'm seeing in you, your stress, your tears, your sleeplessness, and so forth, I can't sit by and watch that happen. So you may not want to go with me to go talk to somebody else, but we're going to go. And I'm, I, maybe you don't have to talk. You just have to listen. Because I need help learning how to help you with this thing that's called stress. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in that vein, um, I think when you said that it's not helpful to say to kids, you can do it, when they feel like they can't, that really resonated with people. And they're saying, or asking, like, what are some words that they can use to a child who is um, stuck in the fear that they can't, they can't be successful? Yeah. Kids, kids sometimes um, hold their papers or their work up to us and say, how do you think I did? And if we overvalue what they did, if we say, oh, honey, everything you did is really wonderful. You can, you're incapable of doing anything that's not wonderful, so that's where it is. That's a real problem because kids get used to hearing overvalued appraisals of their own work. And anything less than that is going to be a disappointment to them. The answer, I think, to this issue is having kids learn to self-appraise honest, self honestly. For example, mm -hmm. a child comes to a teacher and says, um, Mrs. Johnson, what do you think of my work? And Mrs. Johnson, instead of saying it's good or whatever she says, she says to him, uh, you tell me what you think first, and then I'll tell you what I think. A lot of kids will say, come on, I don't know, I, you know, because they're afraid to make a judgment. So they do one of two things. They either over-evaluate their work. They say, this is really awesome. It's great. It's wonderful, because they want us to agree. If a teacher who's worked with a child for a while, or a parent who's worked with a kid who says this work is awesome, and you have a folder full of work that you and the child have previously agreed is awesome, it becomes a very simple matter of saying, let's open your awesome folder and lay this paper next to it and tell me if then you still think it's awesome. And if the child certainly can claim that it is, but you can say, well, does it have these characteristics? When we went over these papers that have this big awesome smiley face on it, we said that neat work was awesome, is your work neat, and so forth. You can do that. The other thing a child might do is to say, when a teacher or a parent says, how did you do, the child might say, this stinks, or this is horrible, or anything. Or I'm do. so stupid. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right. And I think if I were the parent or a teacher in that situation, I would take the product and say, if a teacher says, you know what, I've been teaching for 20 years, and what you've just done to me doesn't stink, it doesn't look dumb, and doesn't reflect that you're stupid. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've got a lot of, a, I'm sorry to feel that way, but I have to tell you that it's not my appraisal, it's not my uh, opinion about it. Um, 
because you know if the teacher presumably has a larger data set to choose from. It's a little harder for a parent to say that, uh, but I think when kids say my work is stupid or dumb, uh, the teacher or the parent can then say you you were supposed to do four things. You were supposed to write a, a half a page, you were supposed to write neatly, you were supposed to cover three points, and you were supposed to do it in a way that was legible or something like that. And to say, you simply, you've done that. You've done that. If I were you, I'd feel pretty good about that. So instead of giving the child these external appraisals that are either built up or uh, n don't have appropriate weight, it's important for teachers and parents to help kids understand how to evaluate their own work. The other thing that's important to do in a classroom is in, instead of focusing on how many kids got the homework right, uh, a, a really smart teacher says to the kids, I'm going to be willing to bet that some people got problem five wrong because I know from past experience it's really been a bear for a lot of kids. Will you raise your hand if you got problem five wrong? And then oh, they, wow. the, kids, the kids do it. She's normalizing error making. She's making sure kids know that it's acceptable to make mistakes. And then she's turning the kids to each other and saying, I'm not going to have you sit with each other and get the problem right, but I'm going to have you sit together and figure out where you went wrong in the process, because that's the key to success here, examining your previous work. So it's that kind of practice that I like to advocate that gets kids to be better self-evaluators and as a result more competent, and as a result of that, less under stress. That's a, that's a great example for a classroom. Um, uh, there's a teacher, I think, who, who's asking, can aspects of cognitive behavior therapy work in the classroom? Um, I guess some people call it cognitive behavior learning. Yeah, I think it's a great set of skills. I mean, if you think about it, the essence of it is perfect for this discussion because you get kids in a cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral approach to learning, you get them to express what they're thinking about. Carol Dweck, another author whose work I love, talks about mindsets. And the key to success is getting kids' mindset out into the world in front of them instead of having them sit around with thoughts about how how smart they think they are, the ways they think they think they're smart. Get those out on paper, get those out in words, and then see if those match reality. So cognitive behavioral therapy says, let's talk about the barriers that your brain, the messages that your brain is sending to you that are getting in the way of you being as uh, successful as you can be, you acting as smart as you really are. And let's try to change those messages. And it's pretty easy. You can do it with little kids. You can say, look, I'm going to give you something to do. You're going to pull it, out, pull it out of this bag. And when you pull it out, you're going to have to do what's in the bag. But before you even do it, I want you to tell me, your teacher, what your brain is telling you about this task. So some kids will say, piece of cake is really easy. And you say, yeah. And when you say things like that, and when you're as smart as you are, you'll be successful. For another kid who says, oh, this is way too hard for me, the teacher might say, yeah, this is this is actually a high school task, and you're only in kindergarten. So let's put that back and do it later, you see? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great, stra great strategy. OK, great. Turning to other treatments, there are some questions um, about antidepressants, about anti-anxiety medication, about ADHD medications. Do those, um, does a medication strategy help uh, deal with stress and the impact on learning and self-esteem for children? Let me answer broadly. If a child is depressed, antidepressant anti, anti medications can help pull a child out of depression. If a child is depressed because she's chronically faced with tasks that are in her perception too difficult, medication shouldn't be the go-to answer for that problem. The go-to answer for that problem ought to be making sure that child is in an, an environment inside a school or outside a school where she feels the joy of success and can be happy about something. If she's in an environment that's well matched to her abilities and talents and she's still depressed, then antidepressants may be a way to go or therapy may be a way to go. I'm not an MD, so I, can't, I don't prescribe medication. With AD, medication, stimulant medication for ADHD, again, if the, if the child seems inattentive, uh, but it's really that she's not paying attention to a task that she doesn't think she can handle well, uh, or she's paying attention to, to other things that interest her a lot more, then, then stimulant medication to help her focus attention is really a little bit misguided at, at that point. If, if the inattentiveness, 
attentiveness is pervasive and it gets in the way, then medication is wonderfully helpful in getting kids to be able to focus and sustain their attention in places they can do it. But I think that you have to make sure also that there's a match between the curriculum demands or the life demands and the child's abilities before you go down uh, that route. Anti-anxiety medications, I talked about an increasing number of kids who present with anxiety-related problems, even who get diagnosed with having uh, generalized anxiety disorder and things like that. Clearly, medication for anxious kids can be helpful, but again, unless we look at the roots of the anxiety first, medicating the problem is not, the, is not in my mind, the solution. If a child is so anxious about everything there is in her life, then anti-anxiety medication, in addition to good nutrition, sleep, exercise, hydration, uh, meditation, biofeedback, all of those things can be very helpful to help with a more generalized kind of anxiety. But we have to look at the curriculum, we have to look at the environment first as, a, as, a, as the initial step in this inquiry. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Last question, I guess. Um, uh, ADHD coach therapy, social skills therapy, do you see therapeutic interventions that have been helpful for children that you've worked with? Well, I think back to, the time, to a time when I was in high school and I was playing in band and orchestra and uh, um, everything musically I could get my hands on. And I still, I was okay, but not really good. So one of the things I did is had private lessons by a lot of people who made me work harder, made me learn a lot of things, uh, didn't fight with me over practice like my parents did, and helped me achieve at a much higher level. I, always, I was always second chair of my orchestra and band because a guy named Mark was so much better than I was. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have to be perfect. I ended up being the student director of a high school band because of some other skills I had. They weren't necessarily my music skills. But I think a coach to help people maximize their potential if it's realistic, if it doesn't add pressure to them, and if they're somewhat motivated to take on that additional responsibility of being coached, then I think it's not a bad idea. But remember, my plea would be for looking at the environment first and seeing what's pushing the child away from school rather than attracting him or her towards school. If they spend 50% of their time being sad and, and, and depressed and trying to get away from learning that is neither uninteresting or they find to be too difficult, that's where the problem is. And the coach isn't going to change that. So I'm all in favor of adding some people to the team to help a child, especially before the child builds up this cumulative toxicity that worries me so much. So anything we can do to break the cycle, but we sure have to get kids uh, uh, in a situation where they're having more fun and feeling the joy of learning and the joy of being in their own lives. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, there are so many more questions. We need another hour. Um, you know, questions about sleep, insomnia, a lot of questions about helping kids accept um, disabilities and talking about it. Um, but, you know, I think we'll stop here. Um, the, your perspective is incredibly eye-opening. I can't tell you um, how helpful and how much it explains to me. And again, to all of you, I do urge you to, to look at Dr. Schultz's uh, website to read Nowhere to Hide and to look for him on Huffington Post and follow him on Twitter. Dr. Schultz, thank you so much for being with us today. We're very grateful for your time. It was indeed my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much to Brain Prep for their lovely sponsorship. We appreciate it very much. It allows us to make these, continue to make these webinars free. And um, I urge you to, to look at Brain Prep. It's a wonderful uh, co-educational boarding school for students with language-based and complex learning disabilities to look at their website, brehm.org. -E Thank you again, Dr. Schultz, and all of you.